Sleepy Chill on Sleepy Time Radio every night, 4 a.m. Sleepy Time Radio, 4 a.m. Oh, Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> where we discuss your dreams and sleep patterns. Today. <laughs> today, we, today we have a very special guest. Let me introduce, um, Wilson... Turn bubble. Uh, hello, Wilson. Thank you for uh, joining us. Yeah. Ah, yes, hello. You had a dream to discuss. Uh, yes, I had this dream. And following, well, not so much following as realizing this dream brought me a great deal of success in certain markets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, it was a dream about an event when I was a small child. We went to a farm, me and my classmates, and there was a horse on the farm. A, a very, very, very small horse. And in the dream, the horse could talk. I know, I know that's not very unusual for a dream. A very, very small talking horse. It seems quite commonplace for dreams. But it inspired ideas and it awoke things inside me. It gave me... This morning I sat upon the rocky shore and watched the sun rise. When you live in a place like this with few distractions, you begin to rise and set with the sun. I had a small breakfast, a single boiled egg and some dry toast. It sat on my stomach like a piece of rough granite as waves crashed on the rocks about my feet. I was avoiding looking at the beach to my right. After last night's storm, it was strewn with the shattered carcasses of hundreds of thousands of crabs. The bodies had been pounded into the fragments of the stony beach by the merciless waves of the night before, leaving a field of chitinous gore and a feast for the shrieking gulls. The opportunistic birds, dinosaurs and poor disguise, pecked and poked through the mass open grave on the beach, sifting through the shards of shells of shreds of meat, fighting uproariously over the fragments of life that were left. Eventually the sound and the smell of it were too much for me to bear. I left my seat upon the high black rock and went back inside. I retreated back to my ivory tower, the salt water streaking my face, not just from the ocean spray. Good evening. You are listening to The Switchboard, 
connecting all points in humanity's ongoing voyage into the unknown. I am the host, and it is 17 years since the beginning of the end. If you listen to me, you probably already know that this world is larger than we are told. You know that the existence of ghosts and other more dangerous entities is an established fact. Perhaps you attach mysticism or fate to this knowledge. In a world full of faceless monsters and living shadows, who is to say there are no gods? Perhaps you see it as proof of an extraterrestrial life or alternate dimensions. Perhaps you ascribe no particular importance to it and just see it as a fact of life. It is your choice and it's not important. What is important is that you learn the truth and you've come to accept it. Knowledge is the only way in which we may defend ourselves. It is true that many in power do not want us to have this knowledge. Some will tell you this is an effort to control us all, to keep us blind and afraid. That those in power are in control of these entities, using them against us to, to control us. Epithets that conjure up images of underground laboratories and wizened scientists cooking up strange creatures in a surgical table or planting circuitry in the brains of monsters. I personally do not believe this. <coughs> I believe that the ones who say they are deathly afraid. They say the things to comfort themselves, to convince themselves that this world is within the control of humanity. Because if our greatest enemy is human, then it is within our grasp to conquer it. I believe that those in power know precious little more about the creatures than, than we do, and fear their power even more. I believe that those in power keep the existence of these entities secret because they wish to maintain the illusion that mankind is in control. Because they know that we need to believe that the world is ordered to design of humanity and is fully within our grasp and understanding if we are to live our lives in a calm and rational manner. Perhaps it is best that most of the world remain ignorant of the truth, that we few remain the only ones who know. We're not the gulls on the beach picking and shifting our way through the wreckage of the world to take what we want. We are the crabs, our shells scattered, our meat exposed to the cutting beaks. As our investigation into the New Orleans cult to revive Order of Dionysus has drawn to a close, let us now turn to another mystery. The Black Freighter is a ghost ship that has been spotted in numerous ports and harbours all over the world. Most recently it was sighted in the Mediterranean Sea near uh, Sicily. I have shared many reports on the location of the Black Freighter of this broadcast over the years. The Black Freighter is a large vessel and the design seems to suggest that it was built in the early 1900s. Contrary to the name, it does not appear to be a freighter. Most reports agree it looks more like a naval vessel. The ship has been unresponsive when hailed, whether through radio or more modern means. While it has been sighted with, it, with its engines running at various speeds, no crew have ever been seen aboard. If any of our listeners see the Black Freighter, they are advised to stay away from it. The ship has been boarded several times, always with bad results. On the 6th of March 1989, the Black Freighter was sighted in the ferry port of Tilbury in East London. The huge vessel had docked at the port, although no one had seen it arrive. Damien Sutcliffe, harbour master of the Tilbury port at the time, attempted to contact the vessel, but as is usual with the Black Freighter, he received no response. Eventually, frustrated with his disruption to the running of the port and the apparent rudeness of the sailors on board, Sir Cliff made the decision to board the vessel himself and tell him to leave. As he approached the vessel, Sir Cliff got a clearer look at the ship and noticed the huge gun emplacements to the fore and aft of the vessel, which filled him with a sense of trepidation. Naval vessels were not unknown to the Thames, of course, but the harbour masters usually got plenty of notice regarding their arrival and passage. Sir Cliff reported that the ship itself was unusual. Its design was clearly before the First World War, but it was impossibly well maintained for its age. Not a single sign of wear or corrosion, not even a barnacle clinging, clinging to the hull. After boarding the ship, the harbour master felt uncomfortably and unseasonably warm, despite the chill of the spring morning. 
Sutcliffe said the ship was clean to the point of sterility, both above and below decks. He called out several times as he explored the ship, but never received any answer. Inspecting cabins and the galley, he found no trace of human habitation. No food, no clothing, and no cleaning supplies. After an hour's searching, Sutcliffe, suitably, suitably unnerved, gave up on trying to find the ship's crew and attempted to make his way back to the deck. Davy and Sutcliffe, harbour master of the Tilbury Port in London, wasn't seen again for another six weeks. He was found unconscious floating in the port. The ship he had gone to investigate had disappeared entirely shortly after he had boarded it, although nobody had actually seen it leave. Sutcliffe's memories of what occurred on the board the vessel are hazy, at best. He remembers shifting hallways, bulkheads opening and closing like mouths around him. He remembers a dull red glow and a sound of deep throbbing, but nothing would explain the pattern of scars left all over his body. We will return to the Black Freighter as we learn more. Oh, for God's sake, the... This bloody thing is gone again. Hold on. Thank you. 
And that was Cattle Great by the band Suen. Actually, on the thought of Cattle Great, did I ever tell you about the time when I got married? I'm terribly sorry, listeners, for that. The radio station is, uh, tricky at best. It is a pirate station, after all. Um, and now for our nightly report. Borosava reports numerous instances of people being struck with sudden attacks not dissimilar to epilepsy around the town of Elena, Bulgaria. These attacks occurred over a period of 22 days. Each a different person would suffer an attack around noon. None of the victims have any medical history of epilepsy or panic attacks, and doctors have found no medical reason for these instances. The only other thing linking these people, other than the timing and the symptoms, is that each one of them had been in the vicinity of a small dust storm. Have you witnessed a supernatural event? Have you had an encounter with an entity you cannot explain? Do you have vital information for people around the world? If so, I will be happy to relay it. Please send all reports to the host switchboard, all one word, at gmail.com. For now, this is the host. Reminding you, never go at night, never go alone, and always go armed. The Switchboard is a Hog and Dice production, written and directed by Stephen Jack Cullen, with music by Thomas O'Boyle and Kevin MacLeod. The voice of the host is Keith Byrne. You can find out more and see our other projects at hoganddice.com. Today's broadcast failure was performed by Anthea West, Ashling McCabe and Stephen Jack Cullen. The song was Cattle Great by Suen. You can find Suen, that's S-U-A-N, on Facebook at facebook.com slash Music. We really are open to your reports, Please keep them under a minute and a half and send them to the host switchboard, or one word, at gmail.com. If you're in Dublin City looking for a place to hide from the dreadful creature that's been stalking you all your life, why not drop into the Clockwork Door, Ireland's first time house? They have a video game room, a study room, a fully stocked kitchen, and a board games and reading room. You only have to pay for the time you spend there, and rates start at just eight cent per minute for your first two hours. Find out more at clockworkdoor.ie. If you enjoyed this episode, maybe you'd also enjoy The Certainty of Death.